here to the end, and, and it talks about a note on sources. Now, now we're looking at footnote sources. Here. This is going to be cool. And when you get here, look what these two professors say. We have dispensed with the usual scholarly apparatus of footnotes. We're not documenting a single thing. Everybody trust us. We're PhDs. We're telling you all these guys are atheist agnostic. Do you think there's any kid going to university in America today who could write a thesis paper and not footnote it and have a professor not tear their head off? And yet we got two professors saying, oh, no, it's a godless constitution. They're all godless. Now, we don't have to footnote anything. We've dispensed with that usual stuff because everybody knows they're godless. This is pure revisionism. This is the kind of stuff where it's deliberate. You got to work really hard. And the reason they couldn't document it is you're not going to find original documents like that. You can find maybe two or three documents out of 100,000, maybe. That's the best they can come up with. And that's just, again, the exception, not the rule. And that's the way we teach history today. We say, well, founders were all slave owners because Jefferson owes slaves. Well, that's one of the 56 signers of the deck. How about the 70% of the signers of the deck that were abolitionists and formed the first abolition societies? Well, the founders were all atheist agnostics. This goes Jefferson and Franklin. Well, how about the other 54? How about the fact that of the 56 signers of the Declaration, 29 of those guys held seminary degrees? More than half the signers were seminary. We never talked about that. And that's what these guys do. They may find a, a piece or two here. They don't even footnote it. But they may find a piece or two to prove their case. Every piece they find, we can find 50, 70, 100, 200, exactly the opposite. But this is what kids get in college now. Wow. I mean, these documents that I held in my hands prove to me that our founding fathers did not lose that deep faith in God. They didn't ditch the strategy of the pilgrims. In fact, they were following it. Congress was printing Bibles and they were paying to send them into homes and churches and schools. I needed to go a little bit deeper into the history of our educational system. So I met with Professor Herb Titus, who graduated cum laude from Harvard Law School, was the dean of two law schools, and is a constitutional scholar. He wanted to show me some little known facts about the university to help bring all of this into focus. Coming up here to the uh, main gate into the Harvard Yard, right? and uh, you might look at this plaque here. After God had carried us safe to New England, and we had builded our houses, provided necessaries, ne necess necess necessaries, necessaries <laughs> for our livelihood, reared convenient places for God's worship, and settled the civil government. Now let's look at that for a minute. We oftentimes hear about separation of church and state, as if the church has to be isolated from the affairs of the civil government. This says just the opposite. It says that if you're going to have a civil government that has justice and law, it has to be based upon a moral foundation which comes from the church. At Harvard University, it says this, on the wall. That's right. And it's it's behind a tree and a fire hydrant. <laughs> you know, what, what does that say? As a matter of fact, the motto of Harvard in the beginning was Christ and the church. Christ and the church. Christ and the church. And then later it was Christ and the church and truth. Do you know what the motto is today? What is it? truth without Christ in the church. Look right up here. You can see it there on this seal. See that top there? Can you read that? Yeah. Christo et ecclesiae. Yeah. Christ and the church. Now notice where it's located. At the top. At the top. Because underneath that is veritas, which is the Latin word for truth. Now notice, without the headship of Christ and the church, how can you know truth? This is on the gates of Harvard. That's right. And the problem is, is that 200 years after the founding of Harvard, they had a president by the name of Charles William Eliot, 
and he changed Harvard's motto, taking Christ and the church off and leaving only Veritas. When we ignore the inscriptions over the gates of Harvard and over the entrance to uh, the, the Langdale School of Law, what happens to a nation? A nation that attempts to build a foundation on something other than God's law ultimately will self-destruct because you can't live according to the law as man invents it to be. The remnant of God's law continues in America simply because you can't live by any other rules than by God's rules. And you can't discard those rules. For example, we hold people responsible for murder, for theft, even though the dominant view of who man is, is evolutionary. We're only determined by our genes and our environment, and the reason that some people do things that they do is because it's inevitable, it's determined. Yet we can't live that way because we live in God's world not the evolutionary world of Darwin's imagination, but God's reality. It just makes so much sense. We live in God's world. Now, this isn't about creating some kind of a, a Christian theocracy. No, the, the pilgrims did not want a church-run government. That's the opposite of what they wanted. That's what they left behind in England. They simply believed that if they could live out these principles from the heart, if they could govern themselves and their families according to God's ways, that it would produce the sweet fruit of freedom and liberty and blessing, and others would be attracted to their success and want to join them. The founders had a clear sense that there were three tasks to establishing a free society. You had to win it, you had to order it, and you had to sustain it. Now, of course, that's the present generation's task, because that's the work of centuries, not just a few years. We cannot put our confidence in just pure democracy to make sure everything is gonna keep running the way it is. You have to remember Hitler was elected with a great majority of German votes. Pure democracy was, was not viewed with anything other than skepticism by the founders. They understood that freedom starts at the grassroots level, at the individual citizen building families of righteous new patriots and citizens. That's what makes it work. This is a new nation when we think about history and world history. And this country was allowed to emerge and become what it is because of the grace of God. And those who founded this nation understood that. And that's why, you know, America hasn't been destroyed like other nations that have fallen because there are still people here who call on the name of the Lord. There's an old Christian hymn that says, this is my father's world, and I'm absolutely convinced of that. And we need to be more sensitive to the movement of God in our history because it gives us reasons for optimism. You know, a lot of times we feel very, very pessimistic, but when we see how God has already moved in the past, why would we fear for the future? People say you can't turn the clock back. Culturally, you can. Both the Reformation and the Renaissance were movements that went back, and they actually went forward by going back. And that's where America is today. There is nothing in today's America that cannot be solved by a genuine going back to the American first principles. 
You know, here's a very important lesson we can learn throughout history. You know, if we want to go and transform America, the nations, we have to bring liberty to man. Liberty is the key component to what is necessary to bring prosperity and justice and, 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 you know, for all individuals. A nation is cultivated not in relation to the number of natural resources it possesses, but in the relation to the amount of liberty it possesses. This is why America became the most free and prosperous nation ever in history, because it was the most free nation. Liberty produces prosperity, but that's not the whole equation. Where does liberty come from? Well, the founders of America recognized that Christianity produces liberty, but it's the source of civil liberty and economic liberty because it gives the ideas, it gives the industry, the character, the worldview. I can be creative like my God. I'll labor hard and, and create things. It gives the, it is the source of what produces that liberty, which then leads to prosperity and justice and virtue. This is the story of America. Christianity came and produced the most free nation that we've ever seen. That liberty was the, the framework that people could then labor, benefit from the fruit of their labor, get ideas, be creative. They were honest and in, uh, industrious, and so they, they were able to, the free flow of ideas were able to come forth. This is why there's no nation like America. This is what has made America exceptional. And there's quote after quote from our founders that recognize Christianity and its truth, obeying those precepts and allowing God to infuse the, you know, the power of the Spirit in our heart to live that way, that is what has been the source of American exceptionalism. That means anybody can affect change within a nation. That's good news. That's very good news. <laughs> I'm looking for good news. Yeah. My questions were answered on this journey. I've learned that the solution to the crisis we're in as a nation, economically, morally, and spiritually, is not to blame someone else. The responsibility to secure freedom for my family lies in my hands. For 400 years, we've had the strategy. We've got the game plan. And it's produced a nation that is healthy and strong and free. And every time we've strayed from it, we've suffered the consequences. The seed that grew this nation was faith in God. That faith produces character, a character that produces great courage, courage to self-govern, courage to guide and educate our children in the right worldview, and the courage to elect today's liberty men and women who will take the torch from our forefathers. The answer doesn't begin at the White House. It begins at your house. I'm no longer gonna sit on the sidelines and do nothing. I'm gonna get involved. And I know there are millions who feel like I do. As for me and my family, we're going this way. The way of our heroes who fought against all odds and changed the world. The time is now. Join me, and together, we will secure a monumental future for our children.
Back to the world, I'll follow. 